Hello everyone. This is the Circuit Python Weekly for April 12th, 2021. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get together and talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed for, to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it co coincides with the U.S. holiday. If the meeting time has changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about the changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. This meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. Uh, the video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, let us know. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports status up and status updates for us in the document. We'll read them off during the meeting for you. Uh, the notes doc also contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you the opportunity to skip around. A link to the notes doc is posted to the CircuitPython channel on the Adafruit Discord every week, uh, prior a week prior to the meeting. Check the pin messages to find the latest note stock there. Uh, this meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things Circuit Python and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Mi Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of Circuit Python libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity for, to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. It takes a couple of minutes and talk about, so take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. Uh, the fifth and final part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something we've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. And with that, I will switch over to note stock, take a timestamp, and do community news. So... First up, uh, community news, the Adafruit Learn System project bundle. Uh, new in the Adafruit Learn System project bundles. Gone are the days of digging through the Adafruit CircuitPython library bundle to find the libraries you need. You can now easily download the code libraries and any images, sound, and so on in one zip file. To use the project bundle, uh, above any embedded code in a guide in the Learn System, you'll find a project zip link. Click the the link to download the project bundle zip. Open the project bundle zip to find the example code, all the necessary libraries, and if available, any sa images, sounds, etc. Simply copy all the files over to your CircuitPy drive and you're ready to go. Check it out uh, in your next guide in the Adafruit learning system. This feature is still new, so there may be changes to how it works in the near future. For example, we intend to make the link more obvious. If you run into any problems or bugs or would like to submit feedback, please file an issue on the Adafruit Learning System Guides GitHub repo. All right. Next up, uh, Hackster Cafe featuring Thea Flowers. Uh, CircuitPythonista Thea Flowers is interviewed in this episode of Hackster Cafe. Thea creates brilliant synth modules and accessories, some of which can be programmed using CircuitPython. Check out the full interview on YouTube. Uh, next up is a mesmerizing graphic from Kmatch. It says, you can make smooth graphics animations using Display.io and the Adafruit Display.io layout widget easing functions. Link to Twitter there. Uh, next up is eight rotary encoders with switches wired up to Pico with no extra hardware supported by CircuitPython. And next from Electromaker, 
is building a Raspberry Pi Pico video conference controller running CircuitPython. And last but not least, uh, in our preview of the newsletter, we have the CircuitPython schedule module, uh, which is now in the community bundle that allows the programmer to use a functional syntax to run jobs at custom time intervals. Um, I think this is really neat. Uh, and, and f yeah, for those of folks who want to do concurrent things, I think this is really, really interesting. So check that out. Um, there's a GitHub IO link. Uh, thank you, Foamy Guy, for pasting that in the chat. Um, finally, the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The articles above are just a preview of everything. The complete archives are available at www.adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next, week edit next week's draft on GitHub. Uh, go to the repo uh, github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter. There's a drafts folder there and you can edit the files in the repo and do that. Uh, if that's too complicated, which it's kind of complicated, so I would understand, you may also tag a tweet with the hashtag circuitpython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com and we'll drop those in the newsletter for you. Okay, next up. We have State of CircuitPython Libraries in Blinka. And an early hug report here, uh, Niradoc discovered that our numbers for the core were incorrect. Um, we were only fetching the first 30 issues uh, that were uh, changed during the week instead of all of them. So huge hug report to Niradoc. And uh, I think you'll know why I'm saying this now. All the numbers are uh, really much more impressive, which is awesome. So thanks, uh, early thanks to Niradoc for, for finding and fixing that issue. Um, okay, so this is a statistical overview of the health of the project really meant to ground us in the kind of like in the numbers uh, before we get into the perspective of, of how things are going. Um, so overall, we had 53 pull requests merged from 31 different authors. Um, some new folks, Cognitive Gears, um, PDB, PDP7 is off and on, Vienna Mike is off and on, Mebs, F Harding 1, um, G, G Baman, um, Kevin Lutzer, Rizal Manda, Dilzot UWO, <laughs> I can't pronounce these, and Felix Erdi, um, all are all new names there, so thank you to those folks. Uh, we had 13 reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. Um, as always, we're always looking for more reviewers because the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. So if you want to level up to being a reviewer, let us know. We're happy to help you with that. Um, Issues-wise, we had 30 closed issues by 15 people and 24 opened by 20 people. So we're net down six, which is awesome. And uh, keep up the good work, folks. And with that, I will move to the core. Core-wise, we had 21 pull requests merged. Um, we haven't had numbers like that in a while, and, and that's an artifact of, of actually picking everything up. So thank you again to Niradoc for fixing that. Uh, we had 17 different authors. I won't go through the names because a lot of those are, are repeats from before. Uh, and we had six reviewers, so thank you everyone there. We have 21 open pull requests. We do have those oldest ones are aging quite a bit, so... Um, if folks want to help out with the core, um, picking up and uh, adopting an open pull request could be a really great way to do it. Um, so, yep, those are pull requests. We had 17 closed issues by 7 people and 10 opened by 8 people, so we are net down 7, which is great, uh, for a total of 416 open issues, uh, which is... Uh, if you want to see them all, you can go to github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython slash issues. Uh, we triage those uh, via the act the milestone designations. Um, because we turned the corner and we're now on 7.0, we, we have fewer milestones. We have zero bug fixes for 6x open, and we have 53 open issues for 7.0. Uh, that's a lot, and we should uh, 
maybe we may want to prioritize those if we don't want to have to do them all before we release 7.0. Um, and we have two issues not assigned to milestones. So that's kind of a metric for how on top of uh, looking at issues we are. Um, so that is that. Um, we still don't have download stats in here, but um, we should look to seeing if we can add it again. Uh, overall, uh, we are we turned the corner to 7.0, um, and we're working on some interesting things for it. Uh, 6.2 seems to be pretty solid, so uh, we're in a pretty good spot. Um, yeah, so things are going well, I would say. And uh, that, that will be my summary. Things are going well. Uh, and now let's hand it over to Katni for the library update. Excellent detailed summary. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I'm putting welcome. it I'm I'm putting it in the doc right now too. Things are going well. Perfect. All right. Um so this applies to all of the Adafruit Circuit Python libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore circuit python underscore, and it also applies to a couple other things, including the Circuit Python community bundle. We had twenty nine pull requests merged over the last week from fifteen authors, including some of the names you read off earlier. So thank you to our new authors as well as our repeated contributors and 11 reviewers and i want to call out les samurai Pupre because uh they are new on the review list um and that's excellent to see that we've got new reviewers coming in um we have uh 55 open pull requests overall in terms of issues we had 10 issues closed by seven people and 13 opened by 12 people leaving us with 326 open issues there are six good first issues labeled within those 326. Um, if you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information, a list of open pull requests, a list of open issues, and uh, some library infrastructure issues, which are really more internal. Um, you can uh, take a look at any of the open pull requests, see if anything needs commenting or uh, reviewing, that's a good way to get started reviewing is to just comment on a PR that you took a look at it for syntax. Um, if you have the hardware, test it, that sort of thing. If you're looking to actually write some code, um, you can take a look at the issues. If you're new to everything, good first issue is a good place to start. Uh, you can search for that, or you could search, if you're looking for something a little more complicated, search for bug or enhancement. Um, if you are gonna start working on an issue, please comment on it. Uh, if you need help with it, please let us know. There's a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. Um, so if you need to know what our workflow is, or if you're new to any of it and you want to get started with it, um, that guide is good for both of those things. Um, we we want you to contribute. So if, if there's anything we can do to help you um, get started or feel comfortable, please let us know. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, there was one new library, which was the CircuitPython schedule library added to the CircuitPython community bundle, and several um, Adafruit CircuitPython updated libraries, uh, which I will not read off, but the list is in the notes. Um, the information is also available on circuitpython.org slash libraries, if you scroll down to the bottom. Um, overall, I'm excited to see some of the older PRs getting merged. Uh, it looked like one is old, yeah, 173 days and 68 days were two that were um, picked up this week, which was excellent. Um, it's good to continue to pick up things that have languished. Older PRs can be more difficult to pick up because of all the CI changes we've made recently. So if you have an older PR in need of updating, please let us know so we can assist or consider closing it and putting in a new PR. Um, that's also an entirely viable option if you don't wanna try and learn um, how to rebase, uh, which is a thing, but it can be complicated. Um, and thank you to everyone who's contrib contributed this week and to the people that contribute every week. And that's what I got. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. And next up, we'll kick it over to Melissa for an update on Blinka. Hello here. Hello. Uh, let's see. Oh, the thing moved. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, for Oh, now it's gone. Um... Oh, did somebody delete it? Control Z. Yeah. Control Z, whoever typed in at sign. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> now let me find it. <laughs> That's a first. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Okay, here it is now. Uh, for Blinko, uh, we had our, <clears throat> which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for 
Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. We had three pull requests merged by three authors and one reviewer. Uh, those authors are PDP7, MEBS, and F Harding1. Uh, we had we have six open pull requests between the different Blinka type repos. Uh, there were three closed issues by three people and one open by one person, leaving a net of 55 open issues. There were 8,230 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently at 72 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, next up, uh, we have Hug Reports. This is the first of two round robin sections. I will start, and then we'll go through the list of folks in the notes doc. Um, if you're in the voice channel and not the, in the notes doc, remember, we just will skip over you. We just go by the notes doc now. So if you do want to speak, make sure you have an entry, at least your name in the notes doc. Otherwise, uh, we'll skip over you. And if we do, just feel free to ping us in the text chat and we can we can circle back and get you. Um, if you are unable to make the meeting, you're always welcome to put notes in the notes doc and say uh, missing meeting or, or lurking or text only, and I'll read them off for you. And that goes... Uh, as well, if you're in the voice channel but don't want to speak, uh, I'm happy to read them off if they're marked that way as well. Um, so I will start, and then TG Techie will be next. Uh, okay, so first off, a hug report to the Mesa devs. Um, this is like the graphics Linux stuff. Um, I was I had an issue with video encoding on my stream a couple weeks ago, and I filed an issue, and Pep and Mir Mir Mercuriate um, were two helpful folks that chimed in. Turns out it had already been fixed, and I confirmed I updated Mesa this weekend and running the absolute latest version, and it's all fixed. So thanks to them. Uh, hug report to Hugo for going over the error messages for consistency. Um, that's super helpful, so I really appreciate that. Um, thank you to everyone who joined in my stream this past year. It's been a, a full year of regular deep dives. So thank you to anybody who's hung out and, uh, been a part of that. Uh, thanks to Minicry, my partner for watching a rehearsal of my presentation for the open hardware summit and giving me feedback. Uh, thanks to Naradoc again for fixing the core stats issue and hug report to David Gloud for linking me to Pete Warden on Twitter about a BLE file transfer protocol. Seems like a lot of people are doing very similar things right now, so I'm going to work to get us all on the same page with that. And with that, let's kick it over to TG Techie. Hi, everyone. Um... A hug to Foamy Guy for their awesome weekend streams. Uh, to at Hugo uh, for his contributions and suggestions on those streams. Um, rarely do I pop in and not not see you there, uh, Hugo. <clears throat> uh, general hugs for helps. Hugs for help. Sorry, that wasn't English. <laughs> uh, to Dan H and K Match, and uh, I rushed to add this to the notes doc, but uh, a huge hug to. Cog knitted the gears. The person who implemented the schedule library. Um, I will be trying that out today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, as always, a community hug for being so awesome. Awesome. Thank you, TG Techie. All right. Next up is Dan H. Okay. Um, thanks to uh, 5D or 5D. I'm not sure. It's Brian Cook, who's continuing to work on fixing the RP2040 um, I2C driver. There are a lot of timing related issues which were glossed over in the original I2C uh, implementation and uh, they're fixing, they're testing things and reading the spec and doing everything that was is really necessary to have been done. And um, thanks to maker Melissa for um, actually, we have a fix we think for this ESP32 S2 Wi-Fi wi A2C problem. And I figured out what the fix was, but I hadn't yet filed PRs uh, to the ESP IDF repo, which you have to file multiple places because they're multiple versions. And so Melissa did that. Thank you very much. That just sort of got me going on that. <laughs> it was worth it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right. Next up, we have David Gloud. 
who has some notes for me to read that says, uh, Hug Report to Jay for seeing for giving me a ticket to the Open Hardware Summit. Uh, Hug Report to Kevin T for sharing his experiment and UF2 to do I squared C peripheral on the Cutie Pie M0. Uh, Hug Report to Naradoc for helping me do me doing the most insignificant PR to the core, uh, 4577, which in print says Space Matters. Hug Report to Kmatch uh, for solving the long standing screen capture in bug in display IO. And all those involved in the project bundler, the zip thing that contains the lives for learn guide. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, for this week, uh, first hug goes out to Hugo. Uh, thanks for always being positive and helpful in the Discord chat. I always see him helping out in the in the uh, help with room um, and also for popping in during the streams. I've learned so many great tips and tricks uh, that Hugo has dropped on me during the stream. So I appreciate you hanging out and uh, always throwing, throwing out ideas. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, to you, Scott, for suggesting to use the CircuitPython org on GitHub uh, for a spot to hold some new libraries to break, break apart some of the widgets into their own repos. Um, it's outside of the CircuitPython world. I, I doubt this person is here, but I owe him a huge hug anyway. Uh, it's a, a website uh, called Arcade, and the person on there called Super Tommy has created tons and tons of great um, tutorials and videos about game development and related stuff. So they're on YouTube. If you're interested in that, check them out. Um, and I owe them a huge thanks this week. Uh, and then uh, just a, a group hug as well. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Foaming Guy. Next up, we have Hierofact. Uh, thanks this week to Dan for discussions and reviews on the power-related stuff, and June Desoc for their continuing work and testing on the NRF uh, 52 port for power. Thanks, that's it for me. Thank you. All right, next up is Hugo. Hey, um, first hug is for whoever was working on the uh, UK translation. They pointed out an inconsistency in the error messages, which is kind of what got me going there. Uh, hug to Jeffler and Dan for the feedback and uh, the merge on the error messages. I am glad I was able to contribute that quickly. Uh, Foamy guy for the stream and everyone who joins on the stream there for new things I learned by accident or unintentionally pick up. Uh, to Tanu for the OHS talk and the recap on the deep dive where we got to ask a few questions and really go into details and the book suggestion for BLE. And finally, group hugs. Awesome. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, next up is Jeffler. Hello, me. Well, um, I want to thank Hugo right back for asking the right questions about the translated strings and then making things better. Thanks to Dan for uh, not only testing, but um, fixing some bugs in the rotary IO refactoring. To Jay Furusin for trying to help me troubleshoot a problem with HID lock indicators which seems to be that I have haunted hardware, is what we finally concluded. Um, Naradoc, one more thank you for uh, noticing that Adabot problem so that we're getting the right stats now. Uh, and finally, to S. Patrick W. and Ketney for helping me out when CircUp wouldn't upload to a CircuitPython 7 board. I think that's fixed now, but I haven't tried it again for myself. Um, I'm sure I will soon. Awesome. And that's Thanks, what I got. Thanks, Jeff. All right, next up is Jerry. Hello. Um, <clears throat> thanks to, to Dan and uh, Jose David for uh, help with the uh, confirming and helping understand or track down an issue with the when accessing the learn guides from Raspberry Pi. I'll talk about it a little more later. But uh, And also thanks to Maker Melissa for the great library and examples for the Funhouse. Nice stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Next up, I have notes from Jose David who says, hug report to Foamy Guy for the streams. Even when I arrive three hours late, it's always a lot of fun. Hug report to Hugo for putting a uh, good vibe in the chats. And hug report to Jeff for helping find the issue on the color picker not passing the docs built in the CI. And next up is Katni. All right, so I have a hug report for Carter for writing up the CircuitPython resetting page in the Essentials Guide. Um, Carter was getting a lot of... Uh, support questions about it. And I know that it's something that folks want to know how to do. And now we have a guide page for it. 
uh, to Kmatch for taking on writing up a guide on CircuitPython memory and um, memory usage, et cetera. I'm really looking forward to having that available. Uh, to Naradoc for submitting the fix to Adabot for our library reports. To Summersoft for testing that fix. Uh, to Jeff for taking notes today and to Jeff and Scott for handling the meeting while I'm handling the newsletter. I really appreciate it. Um, it's really made it so that I can actually have enough time to deal with the newsletters on Monday. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Caddy. Next up is K match. Hey, thanks Scott. So my first hug goes to Mark Gambler for a quick uh, response on exactly the issue I was having with uh, starting or running the cookie cutter for creating a new library, which happened to be me using the wrong version of Python. So thanks for that quick, uh, quick answer and the right solution on that. Uh, and second uh, big hug is for David Glauda Indico and the Purple Samurai for some additional suggestions on saving memory in CircuitPython. Thanks. Thanks, Kmatch. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. I want to give a hug report to Neurodoc, Flavio Fernandez, the real Fenrir Gambler21, Craigs and UXP for finding and fixing an issue I accidentally introduced into the Pi Portal and Matrix Portal libraries. Uh, hug to Dan uh, for helping me out with the ESP Home. And to uh, John Park for testing the Funhouse library and providing feedback and group hug to everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. And last but not least, we have a group hug from Mark uh, Gambler. And with that, uh, that's Hug Reports. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next up is status updates. Uh, this is done as a round robin in the same way, but this is a chance to talk about what we've been working on in the past week and what we plan on working on in the coming week. It's a great way for us to kind of share tips and tricks and collaborate if folks are working on related things. Um, so I will start and we'll go through the list uh, just like we did. So scrolling down, scrolling down. Okay. I gave my outside in design talk at the Open Hardware Summit last week. Should be posted as a video on its own this week, hopefully. I started doing basic optimization on the BLE file transfer protocol for sending more bytes at a time. Uh, I got about 3k bytes uh, per second, which is not too shabby. Um, I'm waiting on protocol feedback, and we'll start bringing it into CircuitPython this week, hopefully. Uh, I'm also going to dust off my Xcode and get PyLeap building, um, because I want to I be able to do both, both sides of it. And I also uh, am going to figure out how to post a tip to a PR when a CI fails. So we have we see this a lot where we get new folks contributing to libraries um, and they don't have pre-commit installed. So so it's really common for us to have to say like, oh yeah, like you should run pre-commit before, like you should install it locally, blah, blah, blah. So um, it looks like GitHub Actions can actually trigger a second action when a workflow completes. So uh, I'm going to take a look at that and uh, having it say like, oh, if it fails and we haven't posted already, then post uh, of like, hey, check out this guide uh, to make sure that you're running all of the all of the checks locally before pushing. Um, so I'm going to take a look at that this week. And uh, that's all on my notes, but I, I've been doing this random thing this weekend of thinking about getting the Washington state which is where i live uh like laws the code uh in github and have it structured as if like all the lawmakers were working in github to change the laws um it's kind of a weird idea on how to make it more accessible of like what the current law is and how bills in the legislature would change it so it's a very weird idea uh that i'm i've been kind of poking at uh, this weekend Okay, uh, with that, let's kick it over to TG Techie. Sounds like a lot of fun stuff. Um, okay, so last week, uh, it's been several weeks since I've attended, so I'm just going to sum, sum it all up in basically a couple words. I've continued work on the watch. Um, I'm working on a smart-ish touchscreen watch. Uh, that runs like a Python, and 
uh, I kept on getting poked by my like two users saying, "Hey, we'd like a little more RAM." So um, I froze the core library for the GUI framework. It's being written for it. Uh, into Circuit Python on a separate fork and saved about 15k of RAM, which was a lot more than I was expecting to save. So that was awesome, and is just like a, a show of how cool uh, Circuit Python's optimizations are. Um, and uh, yesterday and this morning, um, I've been trying to learn more about CircuitPython in terminals. Uh, so I've been like sitting down and actually reading the slash pi folder, which is a whole thing. And it's really cool, uh, but it's it's hard to get a, get a grasp on. Um, and for some non-CircuitPython stuff, I'm finally like starting to understand DVQs and how to actually apply them, which is neat i think they're kind of beautiful um and i've been playing around just for fun not seriously with a custom language transpiler from high level language to c just to learn about how languages work and that, that's been a lot of fun yeah. um next week i'm gonna and and right now uh, i'm gonna see if i'm able to add a time capsule module just as a trial to see if it's useful uh, to circuit Python to like have a string outlive uh, a reload of a supervisor, um, and uh, sorry, um, can, I'm going to try to continue reading what's in the slash pi folder to understand what's going on. Now I have a couple in the weeds questions about that uh, if we have time, and um, yeah, thank you everyone. Awesome. Thanks, TG Techie. Yeah, we should have time to do that. Uh, awesome. <laughs> I got I, I got plenty of time. OK, we'll uh, circle back. And next up is Dan. OK, um, we released 6.2.0 final last week on Monday, right after the meeting, or started after the meeting. That was went smoothly after some hiccups with the RC0, which is good. That it all went fine. Um, a lot of us have been noting, noticing GitHub changed some things about notifications. And a lot of us who made a, a commit to any repo or which had, or we were mentioned in a commit, you're getting notifications every time somebody who has a fork of that repo does something like push or something. And it's really annoying. and. Uh, I filed an issue about it, and a bunch of other people in GitHub are complaining to GitHub about it. And so they took notice after enough of us complained. Um, I added some commentary. As I mentioned, Maker Melissa filed some PRs with the, on the ASP IDF, and I added some more details to that about why we were making these PRs. And then I started working on dynamic USB descriptors for 7.0. The first thing I'm doing is that we have a lot of Python code that runs on the host computer during the build process um, to generate the USB descriptors. And I need to kind of clean that up, especially for HID descriptors. And I need to add some additional metadata that says like in this descriptor, here's the slots where there's an interface number, for instance. and so you need to you able to increment that or, or add an offset to it at some point when you're building a descriptor dynamically. So I have to have some additional information. So I'm I've been doing all the random Python coding for the last few hours or a couple of days, basically. All right. That's it. Thanks, Dan. All right. Uh, next up, we have notes from David Glau who says, participated in the Open Hardware Summit, thanks to Jay for seeing. Uh, shared with AT Makers Bill the historical Discord discussions for one CP board pretending to be a B-League keyboard for two different computers to try to help with the similar requirements. My dual B-League mouse jiggler code is at the gist in the notes. And non Python related made an IKEA hack with our four Calyx shuttling unit and a two-person bed on top. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, for for last week, I actually was didn't get a whole lot of Circuit Python in. So what ended up happening is playing around with tiled map games uh, in Circuit Python kind of reignited my interest in P 
PC and web game development. And so I've been diving into a JavaScript engine called Phaser 3. Um, and I spent a bunch of time this week on that, learning, re relearning some of the stuff, how to do it, and implementing more generic uh, algorithms and stuff. So uh, with, the, with the help of one of those arcade videos, uh, I was able to learn about breadth first search algorithm, uh, which it turns out is the exact thing I was looking for, for how to make my characters move. Um, and I was able to implement it so that you can kind of click on a tile and the game will find the the shortest path to that tile and it will respect walls and stuff and walk around. So um, that was really cool. Um, for this week, uh, I'm going to try to enhance it a little bit further with what's called the A star algorithm, I think. And it's supposed to be more efficient, uh, but achieves a very similar thing of finding a path between two points. Um, back into the Circuit Python world a little bit more, though, uh, for this week. I'm going to finish up the um, new pages for the custom font learn guide. Um, and then uh, I'm also going to work on implementing some of these same pathfinding algorithms in Circuit Python now, uh, which is nice because I kind of get a chance to work on um, the same thing again, but in a different language. So I can kind of make sure I actually really understand the concepts. Um, and then uh, also this week, I'm going to start working on setting up those new repos for uh, the display I.O. widgets. So I'll be uh, running cookie cutter a bunch this week, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And that's what I got. Thanks. Thanks, for having me, guy. Uh, next up is Higher Effect. Alrighty. Uh, so this past week, I uh, got cut short a little bit um, because I moved back to Boston um, to uh, work in a new office, which should hopefully make me more productive. But it did not make me more productive last week. Um, uh, but I've been working on the RP2040 power implementation, um, going through kind of the testing setup and uh, implementation details of that. Uh, I merged in the API changes uh, that uh, were generally accepted into the uh, CircuitPython core um, into the NRF uh, power uh, PR mm -hmm. last week. Um, so those are now that those are integrated, we can kind of split the work between the STM32 and the NRF ports because they're both on the same uh, base. So either of them can go in first. Now they're not dependent on one another. Um, and uh, I've also been looking over some of the reset issues and uh, other things that are currently going on in the NRF port, um, hoping to help uh, Jintasak figure out uh, some fixes for that. Uh, this week, um, I'm looking forward to putting in some more time on the RP2040 sleep that's not being interrupted by moving stuff. Um, I'll be looking at a supervisor runtime report error that Scott pointed out last week, just because I've been working on all the deep sleep stuff in that area anyway. Uh, and I'll be resolving any remaining issues with uh, the NRF and uh, STM32 PRs as they come up uh, so they can get merged in. I think there's some CI problems that are still bugging around. So uh, that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks, Higher Effect. Uh, next up is Hugo. All right. Uh, last week, I picked up working on some string in inconsistencies and just trying to make the errors and messages from Python more consistent uh, across the different libraries. Added some glossary definitions and term definitions to WebLake to help everyone doing the translation uh, understand what some of the different things are, since I saw a few comments and discussions. And also, uh, got some work done on updating the progress bar samples, which is what I plan on doing this week, wrapping that up for realsies. Um, I was going to do a larger review of the strings, errors, messages in the core that get translated for just to make sure we have consistency on style and uh, grammar, all that good stuff, and uh, keep looking at issues and PRs for where I can help. Well, so one, uh, talking about the string messages, one issue we have open is um, the brands by default as something besides CircuitPython might be a good next step if you're in those weeds. Um, you said the brands? Yeah, like branding the build as something, like make CircuitPython like a thing that you have to provide to say like when you build, brand it as CircuitPython rather than it being called CircuitPython by default. Okay. 
I think I get it. I can reach out to you later as well. To... Yeah, there's an issue I can link you to, or somebody in the chat can as well. The the idea being that like we only we in the long run the only circuit python branded builds should be those from like our official ci and everything else should be default to something else um, i see so i could make mine hugo python or a uh, form guy would make Swami python or something like that right right yeah if you were doing custom builds of stuff it's just really like imagine another another manufacturer goes in and like forks it and does it and like by default it shouldn't be called circuit python um so yeah, we can. Yep, I will. I'll do that. I'll then I'll get Rico later. Back. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, we can follow up on that. Okay. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, next up is Jepler. All right. I've got to find that unmute button. Hello. Um, Hello. So last week I continued work on the I2S out on the IMX RT, and uh, it's taken a bit of time to learn the ins and outs of the DMA, but I think the code is almost complete. Um, so the development kit board I have has an I2S DAC on it, which needs to be programmed before it will actually put out the data. And so what we discussed in the internal meeting is I'll find test points um, so that I can look at the signals on uh, Logic Analyzer rather than going through the step of programming the I2S DAC chip, although we'll need to do that someday. Um, two late breaking pieces of news. Um, we also realized that this chip would need the i2s m clock which uh, we don't support yet uh, so that's another reason to to go around it and then the second late breaking piece of news is i think i just fried my development kit but i've got another identical one here so uh, i'm not sunk or anything anyway other stuff found and fixed a problem with the uf2 bootloader installation process on imxrt there's a pull request in to fix uh, kind of the initial installation process if you started with a blank flash chip and I've drafted a learn page guide about using the firmware erase on the IMXRT, which is similar to nuke.uf2. The main gotcha is if you interrupt it, you end up with your UF2 bootloader erased as well. So we'll have to encourage users not to make a mistake like that. I filed some PRs to let RGB matrix work on the Feather M4 CAN, which it didn't for two reasons. One, it needs to be explicitly and explicitly enabled in mpconfig board.mk. Um, and number two, there were some if guards in the protomatter library that needed to be fixed so that they recognized all the different names for this family of chip. With Dan's help, did some factoring out of incremental encoder so that we can share code between uh, three of the different uh, ports as far as interpreting those quadrature signals. Helped out with some CI problems that were affecting Adafruit Circuit Python Display IO Color Picker. Did merges, reviewed stuff, uh, found some links for the newsletter. It's not just aimlessly browsing the internet if it gives you newsletter links. And I fixed a bug in the RE module, which I may have mentioned in an earlier meeting, but I had uh, proposed to fix it MicroPython first. Damien had some good improvements, um, so I was able to take the improved version and bring that back into CircuitPython. And then just for fun, I used an automated tool called a fuzzer to look for additional problems in the module, but I didn't find any. Uh, I was specifically looking at the re.compile and re.match functions. Um, and so now regular expressions that are too complex uh, will raise exceptions instead of behaving in odd ways. And so like specifically, it's easy to run into an internal limit in the regular expression library if you have like a bunch of alternatives separated with vertical bar um, is kind of the easiest way to do it. There are also problems if you have long things parenthesized or long things enclosed in brackets. But for the kind of regular expressions we usually use, it seems to be just fine. So anyway, this week, uh, continuing on I2S out and hopefully wrapping it up this week, and trying to keep distractions to a minimum uh, would be good. And for uh, fun stuff, I designed and 3D printed a birdhouse style enclosure for a Raspberry Pi project. And one of the challenges there was um, my, my vision was that the fan would be behind kind of the entrance to the birdhouse, but I couldn't find a drawing of the POE hat with the location of the fan accurately dimensioned. So horrors, I had to measure 
<laughs> a dimension instead of just reading it out and typing it into my CAD program. Anyway, that's what's up with me. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right, next up is Jerry. Hello again. Um, <clears throat> so uh, last week I continued head, head scratching a bit about this issue with the STM PE610. Um, I think it's a foamy guy, I think, uh, found it on the, it, it, the, on the Feather RP2 Ford 2040 with um, the Featherwing TFT display. It, it doesn't initial, reinitialize the STM P610 after a soft reboot. It, it gives an error. It doesn't doesn't connect properly. And it was kind of puzzling. It first seemed to be only happened under certain conditions. Um, and um, then it finally stumbled across what I think is a, a big clue that may help straighten things out, that the issue doesn't happen if you release the display before you reboot. So that I had and thought about the fact that it was connected to display IO somehow. Um, so that may help track down what's going on. Um, and so hopefully get make some progress to that. And otherwise spend a bunch of time playing with my new fun house. Um, really nice, you know, nice to play with and the, the, the new library and the examples were, were really fun to try out. Um, next week, um, yeah, I'll try and get back and try and actually make some progress and understanding this STMP 610 thing. And uh, keep playing with the rest of the toys. The pile is getting awfully big. <laughs> and the non-circuit Python, I, I came across this issue. I, I was, I've been using my Raspberry Pi for a lot of my, where I built circuit Python just to avoid the Linux crashes that I was having on my Ubuntu machine. So I was going to check something on a learn guide and noticed after I'd recently updated that the Raspberry Pi completely froze whenever I go to the Adafruit Learn site. And especially to the new guides page, and it's getting kind of frustrating. I mean, you had to I had a power cycle. I couldn't even just reboot it um, to get the console back. So I, uh, uh, Foamy guy and um, uh, I'm sorry, Jose David and uh, and Dan both uh, reproduced the problem. So I knew it wasn't just me. Put a qu quick note out to the um, Raspberry Pi forum, and somebody there said that yeah, they run into problems with, with, with graphically intense things and just turn, disabling the hardware acceleration in Chromium was uh, their suggestion. And that, that works. It's, it's not a fix, so it's a workaround. I don't know why it all of a sudden started happening with this latest, <laughs> latest um, Chromium. But if anyone runs into it, it's easy to, easy to at least to get a workaround that doesn't keep crashing your machine. Awesome. Thanks for the heads up, Jerry. I think yep. one thing for the STMPE is maybe look if the reset line is shared. Maybe there's some shared state between the display and the the chip that like that it okay. can be. That's just like nice. maybe it sounds kind of weird. All right. Uh, next up is text from Jose David. Who says last week scales library github.com slash j posada 2020 circuit slash circuit python underscore scales put all my former widget libraries in independent repos uh, next week work on improvements on the graphics libraries that let's kick it over to Katni. all right so last week a uh, newsletter um went out successfully again so i, I think i've got that i hope <laughs> Still crossing my fingers every time. Um, I published the core part of the Neo Trinky guide. Uh, Lamour added Arduino code. Um, I didn't have a Neo Trinky yet, so I couldn't do any code for it. So the rest of the guide um, I, I did up, and she made that live so that folks could get to the schematic and that sort of thing um, if they wanted. And I also continued working on templates. So this week is once again newsletter. Um, then, uh, tomorrow first thing is write up a readme to be included with every project bundle. The plan is to, um, have it be plain text, uh, and it will be included in every bundle and appended at the end will be a URL to the zip that it was downloaded from and the date. Um, and it will explain what to do with the project bundle. So when you download those files, um, it'll just be a quick thing that you can double click and it says, you know, copy all these to your circuit pie drive. It will overwrite your lib folder, et cetera. Um, and I will be working with Justin on that because um, I can write up the readme, but I don't know how to make it do the dynamically generated info. And that's uh, Justin's wheelhouse. 
Um, so this week, uh, or I already said that part, uh, at this, add the circuit Python code to the NeoTrinky guide. Um, so the two Arduino examples are NeoPixel colors and animations and using CapTouch as HID. And those are the plans for the circuit Python um, examples as well. And then uh, finish the the two templates that are going into the NeoTrinky guide. Um, the plan is obviously to continue working on templating overall, but the initial focus will be the two that are supposed to go into the NeoTrinky guide since that's the latest guide that we're publishing. And then um, when I get to it, um, I need to update the SHT31D guide for the QT revision. Um, that board has been um, has been revised to have STEM QT connectors on it, and so uh, we need to update the guide for that. So other than that, uh, templating, and that's what I'm doing. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Kmatch. Hey, thanks, Scott. So this past week, I uh, created an animation library to make uh, graphics easier to, to move around and make your own animations. You can have a GitLub, uh, GitHub link here. Uh, basically, three steps. First, you create your graphics. Then you can basically define different frame windows that you want to uh, basically call a certain function. You can define what that function is and the uh, inputs to that. And then a loop that basically creates each frame. Or you can even subframe it if you want to have smoother animations. But anyway, the link is there. Uh, the other thing I worked on is learning more about C compiling and particularly about make files and how to get basically when you're hacking different libraries together and putting them in one, how to find it to find all those files. So I've been learning uh, at least minimal enough to hack something that works on that. Uh, this coming week, I want to create the first draft on the Saving Memory and Circuit Python guide, which is basically why I created the animation class to create some animations to help highlight that. Um, and there's a link there to the GitHub that um, is basically the comments that are being collected from the group and some of the hugs that I gave out were for those additions to that. Um, so the animation actually right now has a bunch of translation or uh, three translation functions in it, but also want to add a color morphing function in it so you can change color of things as part of the animation. And then lastly, uh, the C programming is all related to the tiny logic friend project trying to make uh, easy to use or simple uh, logic analyzers. So this week, I hope to get the initial protocol talking back and forth on that one. And that's it for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Kmatch. Thanks. Uh, last but not least, we have maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, let's see, last week I added 16 new boards to circuitpython.org between uh, the Blinka and CircuitPython boards. Uh, I updated CircuitPython build tools to work with repos without dot git in the url um i updated the web esp web serial esp tool to provide a more meaningful message if it fails to change the baud rate i worked i wrote the funhouse library i tested if uh esp helm was working any better with the esp 32s2 it was but uh wi-fi and i2c are still an issue uh i updated the requirements on several of the libraries uh, so that I would work with the uh, whole bundler thing better. I started on the uh, Funhouse Home Assistant guide, and this week I'm going to finish up the uh, guide, and then I'll start work on the Funhouse product guide. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. OK. Thank you, everybody, for your status updates. Next up is in the weeds. This is a section where we have kind of <laughs> Katni says belated hug report to Melissa for adding all of those boards to circuitpython.org. Um, okay, so we have two ish topics here. Uh, this is a chance for us to have any f sort of longer form discussion that we need. Um, and if you want to add something, we got a little bit of time, just put your name and, and what the topic kind of is. Uh, for the notes, and uh, we'll get going. So I'll start. Um, so I've started using the CircuitPython GitHub.org, or GitHub organization, for libraries that multiple folks are writing and maintaining together. Uh, if you'd like to be a member, let me know. Folks who have been active already are welcome. 
I do want to avoid solo, solo developer libraries on the organization, though, because they're repos I want us to collectively support. So um, we should work to moving the community bundle there. And then any of these graphics things where like Kmatch and Foamy Guy and Jose David are kind of like all working together on all these graphics things. Um, I just It just crossed my mind as I asked Jose David to split them apart that like, this is actually a great use of the circuit Python GitHub organization that we actually already have ownership of. Um, so we could add people as members to that um, and that will allow you to create public repositories under that. So you would be able to create like github.com slash circuit Python slash circuit Python underscore library name or whatever. Um, I'm very, very excited about this idea because we have had, we are having more and more people who are contributing to things that are not Adafruit funded, but are really awesome anyway. And so I think this is a perfect chance for us to start to build kind of the CircuitPython community at large, um, like out, like more than just what Adafruit is. So um, a lot of you in this meeting are, are parts of that. And so I want to say like, if you if you are collaborating on libraries and and want them to be a part of this larger CircuitPython community stuff, uh, supported stuff, I think that the CircuitPython org is is the place to do that. Um, any thoughts? Sounds great to a non community bundle user yet. What do you mean? Um, I haven't really used much of the community bundle, just a little bit, but it sounds like a great idea to centralize it and say, these. this is the community bundle that we recognize as right. opposed to just a, a bunch of links. Right. Right now we just, have a community, right now we have a community bundle, but it's under Adafruit. So I think that's one thing that we can move over is like, it's like, we maintain that bundle, but the stuff in the bundle is not maintained by Adafruit, so to speak. Um... Jose David asks, how is it going to work? Can you explain the mechanics? So um, what will happen is that if you want to create repositories under this, um, you'll need to be a member of the organization. Um, and I am an owner of it, so I can add you to that. So if, you, if you're if you not a member, um, then let me know. But you should, if you are, you should be able to just go to github.com slash circuitpython and just click the create new repository button if you want to make a new repository or if you have an existing library that you'd like to move over um i would say we should ask like jeff says i'm happy to transfer jepler microdecimal over um and i i think this is a line i do want to draw because it, it's all about um it's all about who is supporting something and um if it's on your individual account that means that kind of like you're the only person supporting it um and there's nothing wrong with that but i i wanted to create a github collaboration space where um we can have multiple people working together on on a particular repo um and so i think that github.com slash circuit python is like the perfect place in the long run i would like like circuit python core to live here as well uh, but I, I, I never imagined moving like the Adafruit funded and supported like sensor drivers or device drivers over to there. I kind of picture this model of like, um, I picture this model of that, like for the, the stuff that's sponsored by a company, like they will be the organization that's sponsoring that work. So the CircuitPython organization is a place for all of the, not sponsored by any particular company, but like us collectively as a community are, are supporting something. Um, so yeah, Fomiga asks, is there a preference on naming prefixes for libraries under this CircuitPython underscore something or something else as a prefix? Yeah, I think you could just do one CircuitPython underscore um, to make it clear, but um, I'm open to anything. I generally like I'm very excited about this idea because I do want to make um, I want to make the CircuitPython project larger than just Adafruit. Um, so we come as a group and we decide what we support and if not, we leave it in our own repos. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. 
Um, and kind of what I was thinking as well is like um, GitHub organizations can have teams. And so I, I kind of think it, it doesn't have to be something we discuss here as the whole group, but we could have like, like I made a graphics team because that's the, that's the thing that makes the most sense to me is for like key match for guy and Jose David or, and anybody else I'm forgetting. Like if we have a team, a team could sponsor a repo to move it in and that's enough, right? Like it, it doesn't have to come to all of us. It just has to be like, there has to be a pr- particular like team of people that are willing to support something. Um, and I think, I think cookie cutter and cookie cutter and, um, the circuit by the build tools may be things that we want to move over as well. Um, that, that maybe we want to in the long run. Um, do you have any thoughts on, um, the mechanics of actually getting repos created? Like, should we create a blank repo under that org and then, um, uh, fork it from there and fill it in under our own and then make a PR back to it for the initial code? Or should we just push the initial code in when it get, gets created? Or Usually usually what I'll do is I will, um, like, I'll create the repo through the website and then cookie cutter it locally and then push whatever I've cookie cuttered, even if it doesn't pass CI. And then okay. once it has that root commit, then I'll fork it to my own and I'll do a PR that's like fix everything. Gotcha. Um, so that will fix like, you know how like we have all these to do's that cause things to fail, right? Like um, going through and like replacing the to do's and like basically doing the first PR is the PR that like adds the re- initial code or, or fixes up the initial code. Like, yeah. It's okay. not, I'm not super particular about like what that how a repo gets going. Okay, cool. Um, Sounds good. But yeah, I I hope this makes sense to folks and that it I, I I'm quite excited. To, I I mean to me it feels like a really big turning point in the same way that like having more and more people um, contributing to the uh, cookie or to the community bundle was like really like awesome to see. Um, so yeah, generally we should consider the CircuitPython uh, organization to be our our own thing, and uh, you know we won't step in the way. The one thing um, I think PG Techy mentioned was uh, essentially deciding what goes in that bundle. So how do we reconcile between what goes in that bundle and people creating uh, repositories, not necessarily ad hoc, but for something that maybe shouldn't go. So I think I, I think the community bundle can ex- include the CircuitPython organization stuff and the individual user stuff. Um, unless unless we, you know, maybe we actually do want a, a third bundle that's just like, a, like the officially supported CircuitPython community ones. Um, like, or the CircuitPython organization ones perhaps as well. Um, you just mentioned three different groups. Could you clarify them? So I think like a lot of what Ada, a lot of what CircuitPython has been is like Adafruit supported stuff, right? Like, and that's ev- everything under the, the Adafruit GitHub organization. Um, but I think what we're starting to see is that there's more and more people that are working on stuff that is not funded by Adafruit that um, is kind of collaborative in the way that like it's a number of CircuitPython community folks are working on it. Um, and so I think that's a place where we can, we can have this like CircuitPython organization work. And then the community, the community bundle as it is today kind of like is a smattering of different organizations and individuals who are, have created libraries. Um, which are kind of unsupported, unsupported by Adafruit, which is why we created that bundle. But then also, like, maybe we do want it to be clear that like each of those libraries is individually supported as well, rather than like collectively supported by the like CircuitPython organization. Um. Sounds sounds reasonable. I. I th- 
I think the it sounds like um, it's trying to to my ears how I interpreted that was uh, partition different levels of support and who's supporting them. Right, and I, I think I want to make I want to try to make it clear that it's not really level of support; it's like who's supporting it. Okay. Like I don't want to say like. I don't want to say that like things that aren't supported by Adafruit are not supported as well. Like that's not what I'm trying to get at. I just I want to make it clear like to people whether whether Adafruit supports something or not or who supports it. Um, okay. So yeah. So it would be for Circuit Python supported. That's not Adafruit supported. Right. And then between that, the communities for single source supported. And then the other repos are for multi-person community supported right. in terms of people. Right. So like if we, Not, like, okay. yeah, yeah, this is kind of the line, the line and drawing of like, we have kind of this graphics team that's come up with like these folks who are collaborating and like, this is a place that like those folks can collaborate and, and market as such, like, or they could make their own like CircuitPython graphics organization and put it under there to do it. Um, but I think, I think the CircuitPython organization more broadly is a, is a good place to do it. Um, Jose David asks, is Adabot going to build these uh, ad bundles and then and the lists? Uh, yeah, I would like to do that. I would like to, you know, I had this idea of like, there's really multiple bundles and the partition, like what's included in those bundles are, are signify who support, who supports them. Like I, I, I was imagining originally a world of like, I could actually convince SparkFun to do this stuff too, right? So, like in the same way that, that like SparkFun creates a lot of Arduino libraries, like you would have an Adafruit bundle of Adafruit supported libraries, and you would have a SparkFun bundle of SparkFun supported libraries. And so right now we've only had like the Adafruit one and the community one, but I think there's also a like this will create a third option, which is like Circuit Python organization supported stuff um and then potentially like we could add other companies that way as well and so it's worth mentioning i don't think we talked about it yet that uh software like uh the bundle fly and circup may at some point need to learn about these right uh other other bundles or some way of learning about more stuff than they know now because already the community bundle as it is isn't installed by Circup, and I don't think it is by uh, Bundlefly either. Right. It just doesn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I I would like to see that the like the mechanics of the bundles, um, like the Adabot stuff, is all kind of like it's all centrally located, so that all the all of the code that's that's managing a bundle is is shared across all the bundles. It knows about the bundles, and it actually puts it into an external bundle um, dependency field uh, so that we can eventually add it, but it just hasn't had the code implemented yet. So the data is there, in other words. Nice. So yeah, I think I think it's just a matter of getting stuff in there, and we'll refine it as we do. Hey, Scott. Oh, one specific question, and maybe it relates to for forking. Mm -hmm. So uh, currently there's the touch deck project, which uses the icon widgets yep. that Fumi Guy developed, which relies on a widget and a control class, which mm -hmm. is kind of the building blocks to try and keep some uniformity in the different widgets and their response. Right. Um, I think one thing we want to avoid is having a bunch of subclass types, right? Everybody has a different function that you know the thing they call it how, how do you see us dealing with like hey there's some of these base classes that are you know currently in adafruit projects and then now there's maybe a fork over in the circuit python group of the same things with some extensions or yeah, how, how do you suggest we work through those things i think um you know i i don't i wouldn't really like to see like i would like to see libraries live in one place um, so I think in that case yeah, where it's yeah. like, where it's like the dis like there are going to be some things that are kind of like pre pre circuit Python organization that like maybe just makes sense to transfer ownership to. Um, okay. 
so so it is possible to say like I want to move this repo from like Adafruit to Circuit Python or or such and such. Um, it is possible to move between organizations, so I think that's one way we could do it. Um, okay. There is a like I I do have to kind of just check with Lamore to make sure that like she's okay with stuff, but I think generally like generally if it's like a whole lot of work is unpaid not paid by Adafruit to a particular library, I think it's it's okay to it's okay to move it over. But, you know, for Adafruit, it is also a question of, like, you know, who's committing to supporting it long term. So, you know, if it's a sensor library and there's a fix that somebody who's not paid by Adafruit makes, like, that's great and we really appreciate it, but that, like, that would not be enough to move it outside of, like, the Adafruit realm. Because we're Adafruit's going to be the people that are still going to like maintain, like look at all the issues and do all that stuff. Um, so I think okay. yeah, main, mainly I'd like to head off a bunch of forks, you know, parallel developments if we can, where it makes sense. So right, it's just really about managing what the expectations are for that given fork. Right. So I think I I think it really is just a question of like who do we expect to support it. Um, so th I could imagine there would be a world of like Adafruit er paid for the original development of something, but no, no longer is interested in supporting it. And that would be a m reason to move it, um, somewhere like we did that with Ampy, I think, like, I think Ampy, we like somebody volunteered to support it. So we were, you know, we're willing to transfer it in that case. Would that okay, for circuit Python libraries also entail a name change from like Adafruit chip number blah to circuit python chip number blah i think i i don't think i don't think for the chip numbers would that's going to ever happen like if there's a if it, there's an adafruit product that has a chip on it that we have a library for like that's going to stay under adafruit i think that in the few cases that maybe we do move stuff over then maybe yeah um like this this is why the community bundle is not here already is because the community bundle, like there might be some places that refer to it as Adafruit slash CircuitPython community bundle, where we should make it also support CircuitPython slash CircuitPython community bundle. Um, so there's there is some work to do there, but I think that that is work that's worth doing for the long run. Um, but yeah, I hope folks are excited about this. I'm excited about it too. It's like we've had this org for a while and. It's always not, it's never been real super clear to me on how we like start to push this like larger than Adafruit sorts of stuff. And I think this, the work that the graphics folks have been doing in particular is really compelling as a like, I hope, I hope that you want to be a part of this like larger CircuitPython community. And, and this GitHub organization is where we can kind of show that part of the community in terms of libraries and stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, Hugo says, I'm excited and sounds really good. I think we're all talking through potential gotchas or questions that might rear their heads later. Yeah, totally. Um, and we're going to find gotchas and questions, and that's totally cool. Um, like, we'll work through those, and that won't be a problem. Um, it's early days. And Scott, just on that point, so where's the forum to sort of discuss those things? Is this in the weeds here or on that GitHub uh yeah, where, where's the right place to kind of go over those things? I think this meeting's good for it. I think um, this CircuitPython channel is fine. Um, you know, there was some questions as well of like, I guess I, I was talking to the core electronics person in Australia and I was like, so are you going to have a separate support forum for, for CircuitPython, for example? It's like, well, no, like, I don't want to staff another, I don't want to have to look at another forum. Uh, but you know, when the time comes, perhaps like, uh, and so I think, you know, it's not out of the question that we, in the long, long future, we grow big enough that we need our separate discord and separate forum. Um, but for now, I think it's okay that there's overlap between like the Adafruit circuit Python world and, and circuit Python, uh, larger. So yeah, circuit Python. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. It's, it's. It's still fine if it, it like we we can talk about that as it comes up. But yeah, CircuitPython text chat is totally cool to talk about all this stuff. Um, you know, I I, I I checked with Phil and Lamore about this um, 
when I first had the idea of like, oh, is it okay if I if we start doing this stuff? Um, and it's something I've told them for long a long long time that like my goal is to build Circuit Python bigger than just Adafruit. So I think that I think this is a really good first step to do to doing that. And that's all because of you all awesome people, <laughs> right? Like it's because we're we're building something that is is becoming bigger than Adafruit. So. Yeah, so there's like discussion in the chat about a CircuitPython libraries text chat, and Higher Effect says that maybe we should rename the CircuitPython channel to CircuitPython dev as well, which we could totally do. Um, any any disagreements with that? It would just serve to differentiate it from CircuitPython help, so it's you know right adjacent. Right. I think it's a great idea. I, I agree. I, like twice a week, I have to redirect. Yeah. All right. Well, this is all really good. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid to bring stuff up like this in different. Um, it doesn't matter where the forum is. If, if we need to figure out f new forums for things or uh, stuff like that, um, that's totally cool. Uh, OK. And. When, when renaming the channel, maybe add something to that text at the top that just says visit circuitpython.org to say a sentence more about what it is, because there's that space up there. Like in Help with CircuitPython, it says learn hardware programming with CircuitPython and gives a link. Okay. So we can explain a little more about what the channel is at the same time as we rename it, or as you admins rename it. All right. I was just about to do it, but then realized I should probably not do it while I'm... Yeah, I'll because do that right Python. after this. If uh, anything gets added to the name or the title or purpose of CircuitPython Dev, I would definitely say let's get a link to help with CircuitPython because I feel like people just breeze right past that um, and miss that other channel for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm open to suggestions. Just put them in the chat, and I'll I'll deal with it after we're we're done here. But I do want to get to this last question from TG Techie. So uh, do you want to go ahead and ask that? Uh, sh sure. Uh, someone uh, just posted a preemptive answer. I've yet mm -hmm. to read through that. All right. Thank you. I think it was Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll skip that and come back. Um, I was reading through and I was having trouble parsing, so I just wanted to sanity check. Excluding when in, ints are packed into pointers, MP object T is generally just a a pointer size, right? Mm, it's not just ints that get packed in. Um, it can also be like uh, keystring numbers and floats and stuff. Um, but it's it's the physical size of a pointer, right? An MP object T is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, because there are places where it's used as if it's just some other other type. Um, and if you look at the macros or something, it, they're casting it, but it. Right. There's some parse. kind of thing on 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 64-bit systems. It's declared as an int. Is that what you mean? Um. I mean, those don't impact us. It's a MicroPython holdover. Uh, I forget the rules for sizing, uh, but un understood. Um, that, thank you. That question answered, uh, at least to, to me. Okay. Um, I think it can be. So there's like what is possible and there's what is it on all of our boards and on all of our boards <laughs> float and int and pointer are the same size and mp obj t is that same size but you can also create configurations where mp obj t's size is the size of double and that could be bigger than the platform pointer or the same as the platform pointer and then Scott is right that different types of values are packed into those as literal values. Um, Qsters, ints, floats, and on some platforms where you use the, the type as being double, I think it will actually 
squeeze any six character ASCII constants into it or something weird like that. So, you know, whatever they can figure out to do. But the ones we care about, you're exactly right. It's the same size as an integer or a pointer. Okay. Thank you. That that's and I there's a good helpful. there's a good discussion of it in in the Pi folder. It's like object represent repper type or something, and there's like A, B, C, or D. And it we use one consistently okay. across everything, but they do a good job of saying like, here's all the bits in thirty two bits, and if it's Q string, this bit is this and or that. Um, that sort of thing is all is all in there. I forget exactly which file it is, but um, it's in there, and I can find it if you if you can't find it. So uh, it's got I'll, a good, uh, it's got a good explanation of the packing. I'll I'll give so, it a grep or a look, and if I can, I'll, I'll I can may I ping you? Yep. Yeah. So um, as for for the consts, I think maybe my um, just doesn't fully answer what you're asking about. It's showing why is const useful. Um, but I don't know why they're called dynamic. Um, I assume that it was simple to support only integers, but I don't know. I mean, it would be nice if it supported other types, but it's, yeah, that's what it does. Mainly what it does is that it short circuits lookup. A name will mm -hmm. so it's So there are two things that can do, speed things up, but because it, if you said oh, underscore foo is three, then it'll just use three all the time. And so it doesn't have to look up self dot underscore foo, whatever, or, or the global by that name. And then if you do that, the names, the other thing is that if the name is global and it starts with an underscore, then it has this complete other feature where it throws away the string, the name. So, so it doesn't take up space in the MPY file in the in the loaded file. Yeah, I think that's probably really the best thing about them right. is getting rid of the string storage because strings take up so much space. Right, the na names take up a lot of space. It's like if you looked at like the HID library has actually like it's half names of things or something like that like names of key codes and things like that. So it's really amazing how much space they take them. Yeah, in my gist, uh, just it, it's a 150 byte file, but it's 250 bytes MPY file if you don't use const. So it can be a huge ratio if it's really heavy on identifiers. OK. Um, I asked the question because I, I was, again, this is not a feature request, just because I'm curious about how it works. Um, I was curious if there was a way to short circuit lookups for not numbers, um, for like bools or something. Um, because if I remember correctly, um, the what what I read the constant folding will not fold an int in an if conditional. From what I read, uh, meaning you can't like. This is a very corner use case, but you can't like uh, toggle on or off debug by using a const int, where it'll like not not compile the code for you, so you're still doing a, a branch, which is admittedly a very small use case mm -hmm. and probably not particularly concerning. Um, but I've had interest in that, so it, right. I think you're it, kind of getting towards like dead code elimination, right? Where you want to yeah. you want to evaluate that if statement at MPY time or whatever, and just remove all the code within it. Um, or even like um, this is this would be something else, but uh, like short circuit uh, function lookup or or class lookup, um, as in looking in the global namespace for a function or a class. Mm -hmm. um, Again, these are not feature requests, just <laughs> peeking into it and hoping to eventually add that when I have the capability and time. Thank you so much for the pointers, pun half intended. <laughs> um, I, I think that wraps up my questions. Um, 
If you look, I would suggest that also there, there has been, the, there was some discussion, historical discussion about Kant in the MicroPy issue, in the MicroPy event issues. So if you search the issues in the pull request, you might get some enlightenment, like why it, it's, it is the way it is. Um, like maybe they explain like why they did, they did this or not that or something. Um, that might be worth looking at. And I would just say, in terms of like dead code and stuff, I think there's a long term, maybe there's even a pep to do macros in Python, which would be very interesting. That's an extremely long term kind of thing. But um, for, for more compile time um, evaluation of things. Okay. Python uh, slowly is feeling more rusty and ziggy the, the longer it lives. But <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think Python has grown into adding stuff that help makes maintenance e easier. So like the typing stuff is for that for sure. Do you want to okay. talk about your not question in the notes? Do you want to just have a discussion around that? Oh sure. Um, so. Uh, uh yeah give me a moment to figure out how to <laughs> phrase this okay um often when introduced to the project and this isn't a criticism this is just what i've heard is uh the internals of circuit python are described as written in c um and from chatting with all of you amazingly talented people it sounds more and more like it's the internals are almost a, a Domain specific language for defining CircuitPython. There's so much from, again, neophyte understanding. Um, uh, source processing and um, patching and stuff behind it that it it really is a, or at least it seems like, um, like C plus, not C plus plus, but like C plus something, so a little more else. Um, and I don't think this exists, but a, a place with a centralized documentation um, explaining what, what those are would be interesting. Uh, and as I learn, I, I, I'll i be making those notes for me so I can mm -hmm. keep it in my brain. Um, but if anyone knows of that, that'd be cool. Because it feels... You're, you're, talking Lexi, about like the, you're talking about like the MP macros and stuff. The MP macros, the... Um, Oh, Q strings are inserted as source manipulation, right? The const Q strings. Yeah. The exception kind of. system is also kind of will throw people who aren't right familiar with it. I mean, I think it depends on where you are in the source, right? Because if you're down in the, if you're in the common hell layer where I'm working, it's like it's pretty normal C for the most part, except for a couple of you know, exceptions and stuff. But then when you're up in shared bindings, that's a lot more kind of micro Python stuff. So mm. and, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm in favor of having a little extra docs on that. Cause even I get confused sometimes. Um, there's, it'd be nice to have some, uh, kind of a shorthand ref. Um, well, great to hear. I'm not alone in that. Uh, and as, as another example, the syntax definition for circuit Python um, like if you look at how the grammar is implemented, I don't understand it. Just looked, um, and and, and then got well, you're, coffee. You're you're, at, you're ahead of me because <laughs> I've never looked at it, right? Like it, it, it Damien George, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, seems like he has just a mastery of the C macro system. Um, but anyway, yep. I, I'm gonna write that up as I go through it. I'm probably going to flounder a lot. Yeah. I would also um, suggest anyone looking, has tips and pointers, like look to see if MicroPython has docs on this stuff, right? Like okay. what you're talking about is all stuff we share with MicroPython. Um, yeah. So I, you know, take a look there as well. Um, I don't know if they have it or not, but, um, and we should definitely document it uh, regardless. Uh, but, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of that is inherited, and like I've only, I've only personally touched it when it's like kind of come up. Um, 
if I remember, someone implemented async IO or the, the yeah. Python fundamentals for it. Right. Um, who, who did that, if I may ask? Warrior of Wire dusted it off and, and did that. Okay. Yeah. So you should be able to find like a PR or two for it from them. Um, okay. But yeah, yeah, a lot of this is just MicroPython stuff. So you'll be a, you'll be ahead of me at least pretty pretty soon in terms of understanding. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think it's important to say that like I think this is actually very common in C land, where like C really? C and C plus plus can let you do so much that like you get you end up having like different flavors of use for them. Um, like different styles on top of it. So um, I don't think it's that unheard of to me. Um, it's just, it's just one weird way of using it all. Um, hmm. yeah. I've heard of like Qt, the project Qt mm -hmm. has like faux compilers. But <laughs> Anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're okay. you're you're way in the deep. So, good job. Uh, I just say, yeah, regarding your like original question, like describing the internals of Circuit Python and C, just to yeah back up like what Scott said, like a lot of the stuff that's the weirdest is circ is MicroPython, and where the circuit python is concerned it tends to be a little bit more traditional so that's i don't know i would i would put that out there okay but i think that's also an artifact of the fact that it's in circuit python in quotes like we don't do any of this hard stuff of like actually being a vm <laughs> right that's that's what i mean it's like it's like the weird stuff tends to be like we don't actually in terms of development on like core features we don't tend to use a lot of it because we're not doing the vm crazy vm stuff that damien was so a lot of it is like less relevant to us i think if i'm i mean scott correct me if i'm wrong but like we, we don't use a lot of that stuff as much because we don't need it because we're not doing the same things that MicroPython was when it was originally putting this stuff together and it also just works <laughs> like right. it, the MicroPython folks did a really <laughs> good to, job Right, like we don't have to mess with it, you know. So, so, so there's there's some limitations to like how useful diving into it is because, yeah, yeah. like, it's done. Like, it does a lot of it doesn't really need to be touched or even described in much detail because it's it's. I think it's, it's always good to describe it if you want to go there, but yeah, it right, shouldn't. It's right. not. It's not a prerequisite for for diving into the core by any means. Right. Yeah. Like, don't don't see it as like uh, an obstacle to you personally being able to understand what goes on on the core because it, it it hasn't been for for most of the people who work on the core. Okay. Um, noted. Uh, that definitely helps segment like what is help segment uh, diving in. Uh, it's still very interesting to learn about, especially because, from my understanding, it's one of the more like tailored circuit, uh, Python implementations. Yeah, it is very cool. So that's its own reason mm -hmm. to go in and check it out. You might phrase much better. Thank you. You you might like looking at like following upstream MicroPython developments as well. You might because it, it can be more tractable to see them in incremental pieces. Okay. Um. So yeah, definitely check that out as well. Got it. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to my. <laughs> oh, it's good. Python crisis. Um... <laughs> it shouldn't be a crisis. You're fine. We got you. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm going to wrap up. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Let me just scroll down. This has been. The Circuit Python weekly meeting for April twelfth, twenty twenty one. Thank you everyone who participated. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, and those of us that work on Circuit Python, uh, paid by Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com/adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. 
the the next meeting will be held. Let me double check. On Monday, the nineteenth, at eleven a.m. Pacific, two p.m. Eastern, here on the Adafruit Discord server. Uh, if you want to join the Discord server beforehand, we'd love to have you. You can do so by going to the the URL adafru.it slash discord. Uh, to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And uh, with that, we hope to see you all next week. Johnny's asking. Uh, I am streaming on Friday as well. And with that, uh, have a great week, everyone. Uh, we'll see you on the streams and on the discords. Thanks, everyone. Later.